From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. Today's episode of Blue Sky features a guest who has written a remarkable new memoir about his incredible life. The book is called Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw, Reimagining Success as a Disabled Achiever. The author's name is Eddie Andopu, and on the book cover, below his name, he adds, written entirely using my one good finger. You see, Eddie Andopu is severely disabled and wheelchair bound. When he was two years old and living in Namibia, he was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, and his doctors did not expect him to live past the age of five. But instead, this determined and optimistic striver has gone on to become a beacon of hope and possibility for the one billion people living with disabilities around the world. Eddie Ndopu is an award-winning, internationally acclaimed humanitarian and activist who was appointed by the UN Secretary General as an SDG advocate, a group of 17 inspiring and influential people raising global awareness for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. He also serves on the board of the UN Foundation and has advised organizations such as the World Economic Forum, the Paralympic Games, and Amnesty International. He is a member of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council, a global change maker, a David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award recipient, and one of the 50 most influential people with disabilities in the world. Eddie holds a master's degree in public policy from Oxford University, where he was a Polar Scholar and student body president, and a bachelor's degree from Carleton University in Canada. Prepare to be inspired as you listen to this Blue Sky conversation with my guest, Eddie Ndopu. Eddie Ndopu, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. Hi, Bill. Thanks for having me. I'm so delighted to be in conversation with you. Well, it is my pleasure. And I want to start with a congratulations. Your book came out this week. I have read it. It's fantastic. I have worked on a book myself. I know how hard it is. And as hard as it might have been for me, below your name, you say it was written entirely using my one good finger. So this is quite an accomplishment in all regards. And I wanted to ask you, the title of the book is Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw, Reimagining Success as a Disabled Achiever. And because books are so hard to write, I'm particularly interested in knowing why did you want to do this? What motivated you? And what are you hoping to accomplish by releasing this book? Sure. Um, great set of questions. I mean, the title in itself is is quite provocative and a little bit cheeky. And yes. I think that was... That which was which you are too, I know, from reading the book. You are both <laughs> provocative and cheeky, so it fits. Well, I, I, I mean, you have to. I think that there's a larger metaphor there. I think that sipping Dom Perignon through a straw is really a shorthand and my way of articulating a kind of aspiration that people with disabilities rarely, if ever, are given permission to claim, right? So I think I've spent much of my life, you know, my advocacy career um, as somebody in the international development space, somebody who's deeply committed to social justice, disability rights, and inclusion. Um, I've spent my life sort of talking about disability and accessibility within the realm of compliance-based thinking and access to the built environment. And I I very quickly realized that the kind of accessibility that I am looking for is not just access that confines itself to the building or the ramp, as it were, right? So sipping Dom Perignon through a straw is really this idea that even, you know, despite my disability, I want a life that is filled with fun, with a bit of glamour that is, you know, larger than life, right? So it's sort of like that, that, that aspiration and that appeal for more. Amazing. And so I know this information, but I want you to share it with others and hopefully they'll go out and read your amazing book. 
But when you say disabled, this this was an early diagnosis for you. As I as I understand it, you were two years old and you were diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. And you and then presumably your mom, maybe you were too young to hear this news, were told you might live to be five at best. Yeah. How old are you now? I'll be 33 at the end of this year. I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's So phenomenal. how did you get there? What was it about, you know, receiving that diagnosis? I, I came to really admire your mom through the book, her role, your sort of innate optimism and grit. Tell us how you, you've gotten to be here. Well, you know, I, I jokingly say, but not really joking, because I think it's quite true that my life is really uh, the manifestation of the forces of possibility. I, I really believe that there are forces that are larger than, than myself that kind of, you know, created the right conditions to be born at the time when I was born, right, uh, in 1990, uh, really at the beginning of what was the end of apartheid in South Africa, right, the legal disestablishment of the apartheid regime. And I was sort of born against the backdrop of a new political and economic dispensation. And I was born to a fearless single mother who really bet on me early, right? She placed all her bets on me and she decided that I was going to have access to all of the opportunities that my non-disabled counterparts were going to have. And so she knocked on every door of every school uh, at the time um, in Namibia, Southern Africa, uh, basically wanting to get me an education. And that was the single greatest gift that I could have possibly received, uh, was the gift of, of an education, a mainstream education. And with that, I was able to go on and, and become everything that I am today, right? And of course, there were bumps along the way but I think really my life is proof that if we invest in people, uh, regardless of who they are or where they come from, that you know the return on that investment are people who are, are pursuing self-actualization and, and who can become everything that their imaginations desire and so much more. And, and your mom had a lot of that. She didn't have it so easy herself. I, I know that your, your father was very difficult, uh, abusive. It's in, it's in your book. You faced an interesting dilemma of carrying his name and whether or not you would go by Edward Eddie, which was his name. You decided to. Can you tell us a little bit more about your mom and how you think she found that resilience and optimism and hope despite having that kind of a marriage and then having the challenges of a son with such a brutal diagnosis as yours? Yeah. So, so in the book, sort of like towards the end, I really give my mom space on the page uh, to really be everything that she's always wanted to be. There's an incredible scene where, you know, I found myself backstage waiting to meet former president Barack Obama and it was so insane, Bill. I mean, I look left, I look right, I look in front of me, I look behind me. And it's the star-studded event with all of these luminaries and these global leaders. And it was a really pinch myself moment, right? Where I was kind of like, how on earth did I get here, right? And so I have this moment where uh, I finally get to meet uh, President Obama and he's everything that people say he is and so much more. And um, I turn to my mom and I'm able to introduce my mom to him. And in that moment, there was something about this magical interaction that made me see my mom for the woman that she has always been. And at that moment in the book, I, I kind of am able to recount some of the conversations that I've had with my mom where she tells me that the greatest travesty of injustice of a system of exclusion and oppression that discriminates on the basis of race or any other identity is not so much the the day-to-day -day indignities of exclusion, but it really is the ways in which people are prevented from dreaming right? From dreaming with reckless possibility and reckless imagination, right? And sort of thinking about all that they could become. 
And growing up, I remember my mom telling me stories about what she could have become, who she could have been, were it not for, for apartheid. And so I, I, I think about that all the time. And, and I think about the fact that my mom had been denied the opportunity to, to be so much more. She, of course, you know, went on to, to lead a good life and, you know, and, and provide a good life for, for my younger brother and, and myself. But, but still, you know, she could have been, been so much more. And I think that that was always at the back of my mom's head. And I think that she, I think that she wanted me to be able to have everything and, 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 and everything, you know, in terms of a life of the mind, right. In terms of being able to dream myself out of the conditions and the circumstances that I was born into as somebody living with a degenerative disability. Right. And so Everything that my mom did, you know, sort of, um, you know, making sure that I had access to care and that she was my primary caregiver, I think all of that was in service of a dream that she held that I would be able to pick up where she left off, as it were, and become so much more than, than, than what anybody would have imagined possible. And it's a beautiful scene in the book because there's so much going on. You know, here's this black woman from South Africa there with her son who has overcome immeasurable innumerable obstacles meeting the first black president of the united states i mean there's so much going on in that scene it's absolutely beautiful and uh it i found it very heartwarming because i could i i'm a parent and i could only imagine that you know the range of emotions that had to be going through her mind at that time it was a beautiful scene and you did give her that space and that it was beautiful In describing his goals as an activist, Eddie says that for him, it's about more than what he calls access to the building. He wants himself and others like him to live a full life. At 33, he's already lived 28 years longer than doctors predicted. And you can hear his optimism when he talks about being born at the right time after apartheid in South Africa. His mom grew up in that system before moving to Namibia and Eddie is able to see, through his remarkable mother, how the apartheid system took away people's ability to dream and achieve. And he and his mom are determined not to let his disability do the same thing to Eddie. While he could not live as full a physical life as his able-bodied peers, his mom wanted him to have a great life of the mind. And Eddie certainly has done that. Now, back to our conversation. There's so much I learned from your book. And, and one of the things you describe in my research is 90% of kids with disabilities never see the inside of a classroom. I was stunned by that because I just assume, you know, here in the United States, we have special education, we have ramps, we have, like you said, you can get in the building, but not enough, not enough kids are getting there. Can you talk about that and, and the work you're doing today to try to change that? And what, and what an impact that made on you early on? To have that education? Well, like you, Bill, I mean, when I, when this statistic was brought to my attention as a teenager um, growing up in South Africa, and by this point, I had had the benefit of an inclusive education, right? I, I was in a mainstream school for quite some time, and I began to wonder, I mean, I'd always been the only one in the room, and in some instances, I still am today. And, and and, and that is both, you know, an enormous privilege, but an incredible burden as well. And I kind of look around and I don't see people like me in certain spaces. And I find myself having those moments quite a bit, you know, growing up, you know, that kind of that isolation of sort of being the only one. And, you know, I began to really ask myself deeply, you know, sort of critically, well, where, where are all the other disabled kids, the disabled young people, like, wh why aren't we taking up space in the way that we should be? And, and it dawned on me that I could have so very easily become a statistic, Bill. I could have very easily fallen into that so, so, so easily, right? That I, that that could have been my life. And the only difference that's separating me and my disabled counterparts in, 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 in the rest of the global South is, is really opportunity and education, right? And so it, it, it kind of inspired within me this fierce 
determination to be an advocate, right, for 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 others like me. And and of course, you know, my advocacy started with my own with my own lived experience, right? Advocating for myself on a day-to-day basis. And then I realized that, you know what, maybe I could do this, right? Maybe I could do this for other people as well. I, that that planted a seed, I think, within me, the recognition that this is such a travesty of justice on such an epic scale. And that in some ways I could use my life as a point of reference in terms of what is possible, right? And, and so, you know, that became the driving force. And, you know, I went on to, you know, start engaging world leaders at the World Economic Forum, in the hallways of power at the United Nations. And all of that, I think, has culminated in, in the role that I serve today, right, as one of the Secretary General's um, official advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, I, sometimes I, I need to take a minute and, and catch my breath and, and I just look around and I find myself in, in rooms, you know, with, with heads of state, with royalty, you know, with dignitaries. And I think about the, the arc of, of my life and how in so many ways, yes, it's me in the room, but, you know, there's a great quote that, you know, Oprah uh, attributes to Maya Angelou, where she says, I come as one but I stand as 10,000. And, and, and I think about that line and how I, I always show up as an individual, but in so many ways, I'm representing that 90%, right? Of, of children with disabilities who, who don't see the inside of a classroom. And so it is my hope that I can live in a way that will kind of bend the moral arc of, of the universe toward justice, right? To, to, to borrow the words of, of Martin Luther King, that, 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 that if I am I'm consistent in my pursuit of more and, and I'm persistent in, in, in my pursuit of, of dignity and agency and self-actualization that I could hopefully uh, help change that narrative. Well, you mentioned pursuit. And one of the things that struck me reading the book is that you're someone who has been, you know, has has seen opportunities and when you see them you go for it and so there's a, there's a great moment in the book where you talk about being born at the right time or a good time at least the african leadership academy is being formed and you hear about it and you and i pulled this from your book they they said we are looking for the brightest minds to join this inaugural class and you say my entire being said this is it now, a lot of people in your situation might not have thought that, but there's something about you. Can you talk about the role the African Leadership Academy played in your life? And, and because the rest of the book from there is mostly centered on you're getting your master's in Oxford that I want to talk about as well. But if you could talk about the ALA and what that meant to you, it seemed like a big deal. It was a big deal. And Bill, if I can be honest with you, it really came at the right time. It, it was this giant boost of, of opportunity, right? It just kind of like, it, it felt like it fell from the sky. You know, here was this amazing opportunity to attend this school on the outskirts of Johannesburg that was really created for, for gifted young people to give them the leadership abilities, the tools, the resources, the skills to be able to go on and do great things with their lives, right? So that they can come back to the African continent and 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 help uh, change things and fix things and 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 really become leaders. And so I I was 16 years old. Uh, my mom came from work one afternoon with a stack of magazines, and um, I was just sort of like paging through these magazines, and I saw this profile on the school, and they were inviting students to uh, apply from all over the world and from all over the African continent. So I took a leap of faith. I, I eventually I got through the, the process, went to the finalist weekend, um, came back home and received a phone call and was told, Eddie, we love you. You're a one of a kind. But unfortunately, we don't feel comfortable in our ability to meet your needs as somebody with a disability. So unfortunately, you were denied admission 
to the African Leadership Academy. And I was absolutely devastated, but there was a voice inside that sort of said, no, no, like I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not taking no for an answer. And this is it. Like, I know, you you know, so, so that line, like, this is it. Like that is, I mean, that is literally what my entire body was sort of saying to me that this is it. And so behind my mom's back, I, I penned a letter to the founders and I sort of said to them, you know, as diplomatically as I knew how (laughs) that they had made a grave mistake. (laughs) Yes. You're 16. You're 16 as you write this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm 16, and I I wrote this letter, and you know, it was like, dear Mr. Swanaker, you know, I I believe that 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 I'm destined to be at the school, and I was like, this might be a long shot, but I think it needs to reconsider. So I sent the letter, and I got in. Encouraged and supported by his mom, Eddie was determined not to become a statistic. She emphasized education, and Eddie realized early on that having access to schooling could make a huge difference in his life. And later, he decided to help provide the same for others. And I think it's important to see in Eddie's story that yes, opportunities like the African Leadership Academy did present themselves to Eddie, but once he saw them, he seized them. And I love the story about his being told by the ALA, we love you, Eddie, but, and then not taking no for an answer and even writing them a rebuttal behind his mother's back. His determination and drive, even at the age of 16, is remarkable. Getting back to our interview, I wanted to talk about the experience that is at the center of Eddie's new book, his time getting his master's at Oxford. So you're at one of the oldest, most prestigious schools in the world. And the thing I thought for me as an able-bodied person, or as you would, as you would call an upright, yeah. which I got a kick out <laughs> of that, uh, that term, I am an upright. What I thought you did incredibly well with the book is you really get into details of what it's like to live in your body. And by, when I say details, it's everything from how you use the bathroom to how the gorgeous cobblestones at Oxford that I would look at in wonder and awe provide this huge hazard for you in an electric wheelchair, all these things. And then also the series of, of personal helpers that you have and the school thinks they're ready for you and they're not. Can you talk about that had to be some of that had to be tough to write. I mean, it was very it, it sounds like when you were there, you often felt sort of exposed quite literally during a fire drill when you weren't even properly dressed outside. Can you talk about, you know, what it took to write that and, and what you were hoping to accomplish? Because you certainly you certainly changed my mindset about what it would be like to be you at a place like Oxford. Well, this was, I think, quite possibly one of the hardest things I've ever done. I think writing this book, I, I, I mean, I kid you not, I literally wrote the thing with one finger, right? So over a nine month period, you know, 18 hours a day, every single day from my phone, right? I wrote the entire book on my phone, on my iPhone. And then I would send the notes to my editor. And and so it was a logistical feat in and of itself, right? So this was not an an easy lift by any stretch of the imagination, right? And there were many times when I thought, well, why am I doing this, right? Like, why am I, you know, and and I sort of had all these, you know, the anguish tears and, and, you know, I, I looked at my carries and I'm just like, I, I think I'm, I've am i gone crazy. Like, I mean, who on earth would write an entire book with their index finger on their iPhone? But I, I persisted and I did it because I, I think I was trying to prove something to myself first, right? And and, and there was something, I think, quite, quite beautiful um, about being able to call upon my entire body in 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 the process of producing this book uh so 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 it was hard but i think what was even harder i think was getting really honest with myself about the embodied experience of being of what it was like right to be a profoundly disabled student graduate student at the world's number one university 
and, and going through all of these challenges, like what did it feel like in my body? And so I, I, I needed to get honest. I needed to get raw and I needed to be really authentic about what I had experienced and what I had gone through. And I'd never, ever, it, you must understand, Bill, that that's very uncomfortable for me, right? Because I can talk about policy. Um, I can, I can really go there as far as being able to talk about the superstructures and, and how people with disabilities are disadvantaged in terms of legislation and the law, but to get candid about how ableism, which, which is the word that I keep coming back to over and over again in the book, how that has shaped my interior life in such a profound way, that was really, really tough right? That, that was not easy for me to do. But I need, I realized in order for people to really understand the larger point, I needed to get very raw and clear about what I had gone through. Um, and so I went there, but it, it was hard. It was really, really hard. It, 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 I can only imagine, first of all, nobody writes for 18 hours a day. That's just, if you had, if you had 10 fingers and a laptop, that is unbelievable. Uh, and then to be that personal, and I will tell you as, as an upright, you accomplished so much by doing that. If I'd been a student when you were at Oxford, I'll be perfectly honest. I would see you, you know, zipping along in your electric wheelchair and you got your helper with you and he's a smart guy and what a great experience he's having. I wouldn't know that when you slept, someone had to rotate you so you didn't get bed sores and, and that your room wasn't ready. And I love the fact your first room was Margaret Thatcher's old room. <laughs> and there's a little details in there that you just amazing, but it also puts into context where the heck you were. Um, yeah. But I think you accomplished a lot with that. So one of the reasons I hope people read this is for that, because again, I can hear the, I can hear about policy and I can hear about accessible buildings and that sort of thing, but I have no idea what it's like. And I, I truly, I've never read an account like that. So I think you accomplished a great deal. No, thank you for that. I thank you for that. And and I think I, I, you know, to me, it feels like the last frontier of inclusion discourse, I think, is centering the humanity part of it, right? Like really being able to excavate, like, w like psychologically, like what, like I, and, and in some ways, you know, without it being too sentimental, I, I, I wanted this book to also be a reckoning with trauma, right? B because I, I, I think the, the trauma of inaccessibility, the trauma of exclusion was felt in those quiet moments where nobody knew what was happening to me. And, and I think that that's a, a radical reframing of how we think about these concepts. Like, what does it mean to be belong? To, to, to belong, right? Like, what does it mean to, 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 to be part of a community, to be part of an institution? Like, what does it mean to, to, to provide accommodation, right? Like, I, I, like all of these assumed, you, you know, these, these, these words and these concepts that we kind of use, they, to me, they feel like they've been stripped of their true meaning, right? They've been sort of hollowed out of their meaning. And I think, through my story, I wanted to be able to infuse these words and these concepts with fresh meaning so that we can better better serve people and better meet people's needs. Yeah, because then I, I put myself in Oxford shoes. You know, they they think they're per, they're ready for you when you get there and they're just not, <laughs> you know, and this the cobblestones again. And, and then and on top of everything, you had financial issues. So you had... And I love you had a, a, basically a crowdsourcing to get you there in the first place. O Oxford yeah. educated, I think, was the <laughs> hashtag, something like that. And then you get there and all of a sudden your medical bills are racking up and they're basically telling you, you know, thanks, but this isn't working out. I mean, you had challenge on top of challenge. Can you talk about that? I mean, it, you just when you think you've had enough, then the money comes along and that's an issue. And, and just what is it again inside you that's like, I'm going to figure this out? Yeah, you know, and and I, I think that's why the book centers so much on, on Oxford, because I could have very easily written a fairy tale narrative, right? Disabled achiever overcomes the odds and makes it, right? And I wanted to start the day after the fairy tale. 
right? So like after the fairy tale has been achieved, like what happens then? Like what happens the day after? And I think focusing on the day after is really important because I think it's like scaling a mountain and you get to the top and then you get there and you realize that you are at base camp of yet another mountain to climb, right? And so I, I and, and there's something very Sisyphean, right? Like, like, you know, the myth of Sisyphus, that like, you know, you roll the boulder up the mountain only for the boulder to be sent back down and for you to do the same thing over and over and over again. And, and that's what it felt like, right? So, you know, here I was the day after the fairy tale, first African with a degenerative disability at Oxford. And I, I encountered all of these really awful things, one challenge after the other. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I think there is a real defiance that I have embodied over the years that tells me to just keep on showing the middle finger you know, and, and just be like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep, and, and there's that, like, that voice, right? That's kind of like, well, okay, now you've told me this can't be done. So now I'm really going to show you that I'm going to do it. And I kind of had that, and, and don't get me wrong, Bill, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard, right? It's, it's actually, there's something profoundly irrational about it, right? Like, it, like there's something irrational about thinking that you can kind of take on structures and institutions and organize, like the way that society has been organized, doctrines and all of these things, like take on all of these forces and win, right? It's a very David and Goliath thing, but I, I it, for whatever reason, it's just like that has always been me. When you read Eddie's book, which I encourage you to do, you come away amazed by his defiance, especially as it's coming from a small young man in a wheelchair who is largely helpless physically. He really does a great job of painting a vivid and at times painful picture of his life in the weeks and months after what he describes as the fairy tale of acceptance to Oxford. And I like his use of the myth of Sisyphus, not to mention the adjective Sisyphean. It did make me wonder though, who was responsible for coming up with that one? Choosing not to use Sisyphusian, which you have to agree would have been a much cooler word. Anyway, regardless of the words used to describe it, overcoming the number of obstacles, humiliations, and challenges that came Eddie's way required an incredible level of persistence and determination. Getting back to our conversation, I wanted to talk to Eddie about more details in his book, including his many caregivers who feature prominently in his story. And you are very gracious because you describe your caregivers by number, number one, number two, because there are many in the book. And, and even, you know, there's one that you, you find out is homophobic and, and you identify as gay and you find out he's saying, I don't like queers. And, and you're like, I need a new caregiver. <laughs> you, don't, you don't put up with it. <laughs> it's like, next. So I think there's something in your story that's interesting in terms of you taking on these big, issues on a global level, but you're also just very like, what's in front of you? It's like, nope, sorry, next. Uh, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what I will say is that I, I also hope that in some ways, you know, and this is probably going to be a little bit provocative to say this, but I think it's important is that I, I, I think part of my story is also like an anti grit memoir a little bit, right? Like grit has always been important to me, but I think sometimes we place so much onus on the individual to, to fix things, right? And, and that we don't really allow institutions and society to meet people halfway, right? Like I, I kind of, I, I, I think this is also, this is very, this is very much a memoir about exhaustion too, right? about being depleted, right? It, it's, 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 it's exhausting to read, right? As it was to yeah. write. I, no, I, I, <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. No, in a right. good way though, in a way that helps someone like me 
try to relate to what you want. Right. To. And, and, and try to be like, so how do we ensure, you know, because I think, you know, there were, at some point in the book, you know, I sort of admit that all I really wanted to do was just have a great graduate experience to go to all the parties, to wander the city, to do all of the things that my non-disabled counterparts were doing and I felt robbed of of my experience because so much of it was focused on survival and making it work. And I think there's there's an unfairness there, right? So why while I pride myself on my ability to kind of be resilient and push through, the flip side of that is that I I I think that that, that there's something unfair that they're, you know, that they're, that they're those among among us that have to be strong all the time. Right. And it's kind of this idea that like, well, can we give people a break? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And an Oxford graduate program is hard enough. <laughs> right. Everything else. Right. I mean, I, I don't know how I graduated. <laughs> yeah. No. And you talk about being out in town and you're out with your friends and you go to the movies and the, at the front of the theater, they're like, no, sorry. We can't accommodate you here. So even when you're trying to have that glimmer, it's really inspiring. So speaking of inspiring, uh, in the years since, your work has been remarkable. So can you explain and, and sort of chart for us, you know, you, you get you get this prestigious degree. And I met you through Elizabeth Cousins, who runs the UN Foundation, very prestigious organization. You happen to be a board member. And you've been selected on this short list of people to work on the by the Secretary General of the United Nations to work on the state sustainability goals. So can you walk us through sort of the work you've done since, the, the the areas you're trying to impact and what you hope to do with this next phase of your life? Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been really extraordinary. I, I mean, some of the things that have happened to me, I, I still marvel at. Um, I have the great honor of, of sitting on the board of the UN Foundation, the youngest board member. You know, I, I, I think my work is really around pushing the boundaries of representation. Um, as well, I, I mean, the United Nations, um, its sustainable development goals is underpinned by this idea of leaving nobody behind. It's 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 one of the the core tenets of the work of the UN. How do we ensure that some of the most vulnerable and marginalized segments of society uh, benefit um, from the global world order, um, and and their lives are made more livable? Right. So I. Um, have had my own struggles, but I think I'm uniquely positioned to be able to think about what are the key policies that can uh, make a difference in people's lives, right? And so I do that on a global level in my work with the UN, um, supporting the Secretary General, supporting the UN Foundation and, and various other multilateral institutions to really become the very best version of themselves and actually live up to the expectation of ensuring that every person on the planet lives with dignity, right? So I've, I've, I've leaned into my global humanitarian work since graduating from Oxford in 2017. So for the last six or seven years, um, I've been on that path and, and I think it's my life's purpose. I'm ready to pivot once more. And, and do other things with my life and, and sort of, you know, think about how storytelling can be used to, to create change. You know, I, my definition of activism, it, it, it's really the work of the imagination, right? Because it's about envisioning a world that doesn't yet exist and going after that world, right? And so um, there are many ways to do that, right? Um, and, and so I hope that I could my next chapter will be, you know, uh, a, a career in film and television. Um, and, and it seems different from what I've been doing. But I think the true line is this idea of, of changing hearts and minds about what's possible. It was interesting to hear Eddie describe wanting his book to be anti-grit. Eddie himself has nothing but grit, for sure. But his point is that this can only take someone in his situation so far. To gain the kind of accessibility and opportunity he's looking for, institutions have to work on inclusion as well. Eddie is a young man with a clear purpose to advocate, as he says, for every person on the planet 
to be able to live with dignity. And he sees his activism as a work of imagination. And speaking of imagination, wait until you hear what one of Eddie's next goals is. Your aspirations are not just earthbound. You have talked about wanting to be the first wheelchair-bound person in outer space. Yeah. Absolutely. So if anyone from NASA or <laughs> NASA or, or uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk are listening, uh, can you talk? I mean, truly. I, it, and when I first heard that, I thought that's never happened before, has it? And wouldn't that be amazing? And wouldn't Eddie be the right guy? <laughs> talk about that. Well, I think it's so symbolic, right? It, 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 it has a deeper message, a deeper meaning that I hope would be inspiring for all of humanity but what kind of signal that possibility that if we can get somebody like me up into space, then imagine what we can do here on earth. And, and so this is a campaign that I have dreamt about and talked about for a couple of years now. And, and I've come really, really, really close, you know, to, to getting it done. And, and it's my hope that, that very soon that, you know, that door of opportunity will just open wide open for me and and I'll be able to accomplish this feat but but you're right bill it 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 is uh, you know it's it's the message it's the statement it's it's the audacity of it that I think um just makes me smile and and makes me want to do it yeah uh, you know even more well if any decision maker needs more inspiration you said that you plan to deliver a televised address from space to the united nations in the audience of world leaders, and you called this your love letter to the enduring power of the human spirit. And if that doesn't get people's <laughs> attention, I don't know what will. And, and that's the other thing, another thing, Eddie, that struck me in the book. You are you have an incredible way with words, and and knowing now that you are spending eighteen hours a day with one finger on a phone makes it that much more amazing. And one of the things I read, there's a quote from you that I really liked. You said, I think disability reminds people that actually imperfection is more intrinsic to us all than perfection is. And I thought that was really beautiful because there's a lot of people out there online in particular who've got this, you're going to be perfect at that and you're going to have the perfect work-life balance and you're going to have six-pack abs and your hair is going to look just right. And, you're going to... and here you are, uh, given the challenge that you have, and you're reminding us that no imperfection is more what brings us all together and, and ties our humanity together than perfection is. Can you ex can you expand on that? Because I just thought it was an incredibly beautiful statement. Yeah, and and this is why I believe so profoundly that disability is an offering to humanity because I think disability teaches us new ways of being, new ways of showing up in the world, right? New ways of being productive new ways of being beautiful, right? New ways of being human, right? Um, because it very much is about contending with the fragility of our bodies, right? And the fragility of our minds. And, and embracing that is so hard. I, I mean, I, I try, right? But I am also implicated in ableism as we all are, right? So I myself also... I'm trying to unlearn and undo all of the ways in which I've been indoctrinated to believe that, that some bodies are more valuable than others, right? Like undoing that work is also my work, right? In as much as it is the work of my able-bodied brothers and sisters and siblings around the world, um, I'm, I'm part of that struggle too. But I think there is something liberating when we give up the hope that perfection will somehow protect us um, because it doesn't, right? It, it doesn't protect us. And I think that when we lean into the imperfection of our bodies, the imperfection of our lives and embrace the complexity and messiness of what it means to be a human being living on the planet, if we're able to do that work, I think that we can find for ourselves the ki a kind of liberation, a kind of freedom that is so good that it almost feels unfathomable, right? Like I think that that is, that is the gift that disability has brought to my life. And, and it's, 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 you know, um, it, it's my hope that, 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 that people will see that 
and, and that people will embrace for themselves um, a new kind of way of being and showing up in the world. It's a perfect way to wrap up our conversation. And I, I want to say again, uh, first of all, you, you are the human embodiment of optimism and hope and determination, and you're just as inspiring as you were. And just like books are always better than the movies, I hope people enjoy this podcast, but trust me, the book's better. Uh, so go out, <laughs> go out and buy it. It's called Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw, Reimagining Success as a Disabled Achiever. You're an incredible person, Eddie. Thank you, Bill. And I know you're busy and you're promoting a book. I wish you all the success you deserve for it. And I really look forward to staying in touch. And um, I, I wish you nothing but great things. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Take care. Okay, how cool would it be if Eddie from outer space gave a live address to the United Nations? And I love the way he describes disability as an offering to humanity and a gift. I also think we do well to pay close attention to Eddie when he says that perfection does not protect us and that we need to embrace the complexity and the messiness. In a funny roundabout way, these can actually be seen as optimistic and hopeful words from this truly inspiring person. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky episode with Eddie and Dopu, and we'll also read his great new book, Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw. Please let us know your thoughts on this and other episodes by leaving us a review or rating. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you enjoy this content, please follow the Optimism Institute online. These efforts are easy and far from Sisyphean. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke. And I thank you for listening. Listening.